Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Um, today we will continue talking about how molecules are uh, formed from different atoms. Um, primarily it will be a few examples um, and uh, a couple of principles on which uh, this bonding is based. So today's lecture is called Balance Electrons. So um, this lecture is part of the course. Um, and the course is called Physics for Teens. It's presented on unizor.com. Um, I do suggest you to watch this lecture from the website because the lecture has textual description next to it on the website. So if you go to um, menu, you choose the Physics for Teens uh, course. Um, then the part which this lecture belongs to is atoms and within it you will have basically a few different topics including um, the one which basically explains how the combination of atoms makes a molecule and the lecture is part of this uh, topic. So, um, we did talk about uh, different shells of electrons around the nucleus. And we did talk that chemical reactions involve only electrons <coughs> and primarily the outer shells. Because the further electron from the nucleus, well, the easier it is to kind of combine with some other atoms, it's easier to move around, so to speak. Obviously, this is a model. This is our model of how atom is basically constructed. But again, we do have experiments which kind of confirm this model to a very high degree of precision. So, we accept this model. And based on this model, again, as you know from the previous lectures, electrons are um, positioned around the nucleus um, in, in shells and shells are subdivided into subshells. Now, if you don't really know what I'm talking about, I suggest you to go back into the lecture um, on the same course, obviously, uh, where I explain uh, how the electrons are structured around the nucleus, including energy levels. Because I am definitely will be using in this lecture all this material. So, I accept that we know about shells and subshells. We know about number of electrons uh, per subshell. Uh, and we know that there are um, certain names of these subshells. So I will use it. I assume that you know about it. Now, the next thing is that for some reason, and uh, it's all based on quantum theory, etc. Um, atoms would behave more, well, I would say, stable if their shells and subshells are complete. So, as we know, every shell has certain number of subshells. The first shell has one subshell, the second shell has two subshells, the third has three, etc. And every subshell have certain number of electrons, 2, 6, 10, 14, etc., with a step of 4. So, these are maximum number of electrons. Now, the subshells are filled up in the level of increasing energy. Potential energy is negative, so increasing means less by absolute value being negative, closer to zero. Zero is in, infi in, in infinity. So, the further we are, the greater the possibility of these electrons to fly away, but at the same time, atoms are more stable when their shells and subshells are completed, are filled to their maximum. So, like, for example, hydrogen has only one electron, in the first subshell of the first shell, whereas it's supposed to be, the maximum is supposed to be two. Now the helium 
has two electrons, which means completely filled up the first shell and first subshell. So the helium is basically um, uh, inert. It's an inert gas. It doesn't react chemically, not easily react chemically with other um, elements, while hydrogen very easily combined with uh, oxygen and it gives H2O, which is water. So, again, atoms are trying to complete their shells to be more chemically stable. So, if the shell is complete, they are not easily react with some other uh, elements. And the example is all the inert gases, like helium, neon, uh, xenon, etc. Okay, so, based on this, um, we can state the following. So, why different atoms can chemically react with each other, making a molecule? Well, that happens when, in some way, let's talk about two elements. These two elements complement each other as far as um, their number of electrons in shells and subshells. For example, if one particular element has only one electron on the outer um, subshell and another element has one electron less than the maximum, they complement each other. So the electron can move to that element and now this becomes positive, this becomes negative and they stick to each other. That's just an example. Or another example. For instance, again, something like two electrons are like extra on the top level shell and two electrons are missing. Well, maybe these electrons can, outer shell electrons can combine together and being basically like a common property of both elements and they fill basically this and that subshell because they are shared, so to speak. Again, <coughs> I'm not talking about how physically this mechanism of sharing is, is actually um, going on, but it's j just a model, if you wish, and the model works. Now, this lecture will be probably about certain examples rather than theory. Theory is, again, it, it's kind of deep, it goes to quantum theory, etc., which is completely beyond the level of this course. So, certain things you just have to take as axiom, like, for instance, shells and subshells, the number of subshells per shell, the number of electrons per subshell, etc. If I will talk about this, I just assume it as a given, without any kind of um, going into a theory why why the first subshell of the first shell has two electrons. I'm not going into this. So I'm taking it as granted and I will um, talk about a few examples to basically um, explain on example what exactly is happening. Okay, so my first example, which by the way we did talk about this before. I have sodium and I have chlorine. Okay, now, the sodium has, this is electron configuration of sodium. I will write it first, and then I will explain what exactly I mean. Now, what is this? This is the first shell. It has only one subshell the first one, which is abbreviated as S, for historical reason. Now, the second shell, 2 and 2, has two subshells, because the shell number N should have N subshells, okay? So, the second shell has two subshells, the first and the second. The first, again, is called S, the second is called P, for historical reason. Now, the number of electrons, first subshell, two, and then four more, and four more, four more, etc. Now the third subshell, the third subshell has only one first sub, first third shell has only one first subshell, and there is only one electron left because the atomic number is 11. 2 and 2 and 6 is 10, 10, 11. So 10, 10, 11 electrons. So 11 electrons 
are distributed among three shells, two, uh, eight, and one. Now, what's complete, what's not complete? Well, the first shell is complete. It has only one subshell, and it's filled up to capacity. The second shell is complete because it has two shells, and uh, both are filled to capacity. This is maximum two, this is maximum uh, six. Now, the third shell is incomplete. Well, first of all, in theory, it can have up to three different subshells, but that's half of the problem. The most important problem is that the top shell, which is shell S of the third shell, has only one electron, while its capacity is two. You see, two, two, and this is one. So the capacity of this subshell is two, but it contains only one. Now, let's talk about chlorine. Chlorine has 1s2, the same thing, 2s2 and 2p6. Next is 3s2 and 3p5. Okay, here is we have in the beginning we have similar situation. The first shell, the second shell, completely filled up, completely filled up. Now the third shell, well, in theory, the third shell could, should have three subshells, but we don't even have the third one, we have only first two, which is okay, it's not a problem. Now let's talk about subshells. The first subshell, again, is filled to capacity. The second subshell, P, P, you see, P is supposed to have six maximum, right? Now we have only five. Now the... Um, atomic number is 17, so we're supposed to have 17 uh, electrons, so it's 2 and 2, 6 and 10 and 5, 7, okay, 17, 17 electrons. So what happens in this particular case? Well, this electron is kind of extraneous, if you wish, and this has one less than the maximum. You see, that's the pair, that's the match. It's a happy marriage, basically, between these two elements. Because what this thing can give, this thing could take, and then both will be complete. This will not have the third shell at all, and the previous one are filled up. And this one will have the last, the, the topmost subshell filled up to six electrons. So if one, one electron from here will migrate to here, there will be a nice bonding. Now, under what circumstances electrons can migrate? Well, usually, and again, I'm not talking about every individual case and, and, and every individual condition, but usually metals have electrons freer than, let's say, non-metals. So, uh, sodium is a metal, um, and the electrons on the outer shell are generally, well, kind of moving. They're, they're not completely free, but to free them from the nucleus is easier in metals than, let's say, in non-metals. So, this electron can migrate, and it does, because, again, atoms are striving to complete their uh, subshells. And that's why this electron, which is kind of migrating, and this atom wants to complete its own, I I its, its uh, uh, topmost uh, subshell, this electron goes here. As a result, what happens? Well, as a result, natri natrium, sodium, becomes positively charged, right? One electron goes here, so it becomes positively charged. The atom of uh, um, sodium, the atom of chlorine becomes negatively charged because it has one electron more. You see, before we had the same number of electrons as protons in the nucleus and the atom was neutral. If one electron is migrated, then this becomes positive, this becomes negative because there is a pro number of protons one more and number of protons here one less than the number of electrons. And there is a connection, electrostatic connection between them, because positive and negative are combined together. And that's how we have 
the natrium chloride, which is salt, basically, which we use at home. So that's an example of the kind of bonding between atoms, which is called electrovalent or ionic um, bonding. Why is it called ionic? Because positively or negatively charged atom, when it's losing or gaining an electron, is called ion. So this bonding is called ionic, or sometimes electrovalent bonding. bonding. So that's it with this example. This is an example of ionic bonding. And I will do something more in the same... A um, couple of more examples of ionic bonding. Okay, next one is... Barium. Okay. This is 56. And I will have a lot of problems here. Anyway, I'm not going to put all these electrons. I will put only the top one. The top one is 6s2, which means the shell number 6, the first subshell, s is the first subshell, and it has two electrons. Okay. Now, and we use the same chlorine, which and the, at the end has uh, 3p5. The third subshell has 5, um, uh, the second, uh, third shell, second subshell has 5 electrons. Now, this is a complete um, subshell, because the subshell S has supposed to be maximum two electrons, and they are. However, the six shell itself has only one subshell. And um, again, for certain reasons, if it's just one particular subshell in a shell, it's still vulnerable. And since it's vulnerable, it can actually give up these because the attraction to this particular atom is really great because this atom really wants to capture extra electrons and considering the electrons on the six shell are really far away from the nucleus there is a possibility that these two will combine however you see there are two electrons here on this top level subshell this one needs only one electron. So what happens? Well, what happens is the following. Barium is losing two electrons, but one is going to one atom of chlorine and another goes to another atom of chlorine. So these two electrons are captured by two different atoms of chlorine and that would be the chemical formula is barium chlor that means two atoms of chlorine to one atom of barium. So that's another example when this um, top level subshell is filled, but considering it's an S on the sixth subshell, I mean the first shell on the sixth sub, uh, first subshell on the sixth shell, and it's relatively far from nucleus, it's still vulnerable to being captured by some active atom of chlorine in this case. Now, um, just as a definition, the electrons which are involved in this moving around are called valence electrons. Um, and every element has certain characteristic which is called valency which is number of valence electrons. So number of valence electrons is two, number of valence electrons is one. So that's why we have two 
links from ion of barium and one link goes to each atom of chlorine because chlorine has valency of one and barium has valency of two. Okay, now let me make your life slightly more complicated. Now again this is ionic um, bonding because electrons are really moving from one atom to another. Okay, now let me give another example. So things are getting a little bit more complex with every new example. Aluminum. Uh, 13 atomic. And oxygen, which is 8. So aluminum is 1s2, 2s2, that's not interesting, 2p6, that's the beginning. Everything is fine. Now, the third one, S2, as it's supposed to be, 3P1. So, the third shell has two out of three subshells, but two is already fine. I mean, now this one is completely filled up. This one has one extra electron. I mean, it has one out of six, which means it's vulnerable considering aluminum is a metal so the top level subshell has one electron which is well kind of can be captured now the oxygen has 1s2 2s2 and 2p4 okay so what do we have here now this thing can hold up to six, right? The maximum is for P, for the second subshell, is six. It has only four, so it needs two more. Well, this one has one more, which implies that maybe we can have something like um, aluminum or aluminum. So one electron from here goes to an um, atom of uh, oxygen and one electron from another aluminum atom goes here. And that would make the level 2 complete, would be P6. So the formula is aluminum 2 O. Well, the problem is that it leaves, if I would take this electron, it leaves only one um, subshell in the top shell. And as before with barium, for, for example, you remember that if it's only one subshell, it's still vulnerable. So what I want to say is that these electrons are also vulnerable. Uh, it means it can be captured by some other atoms. Now, what if all three electrons are out? Well, three electrons, this needs only two, so the good combination would be um, O, aluminum, uh, O, uh, aluminum, O. So, three electrons are lost from aluminum, and two electrons go to this one, you see, two. Two electrons from this and from this go to this, and two electrons goes to this. So each, each atom of um, oxygen receive, receives two electrons, and each atom of aluminum loses three electrons. So the formula would be aluminum 2O3. Now, apparently, this which leaves the top subshell uh, basically naked, even complete but naked, not protected by other subshells, is much less stable chemical combination. Actually, there are some special conditions when it can happen. So in, 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 in practical life, this thing practically never happens. 
this thing does happen. This is a normal kind of um, combination. That's actually how aluminum is um, mined. I mean, mi not mined, whatever. It, 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 this is the combination which occurs in nature, and from this we extract aluminum using some process, whatever the process is. So, aluminum can actually be either single valence electron, electrons or three valence. Three is more, not significantly more often occurs in nature. As a um, one valence electrons, it practically never happens except some special conditions. So this is a little bit more uh, nuance in the theory of valency of different atoms. The oxygen, I have to tell you, is always uh, it, 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 it is al always has valency of two because it needs exactly two to complete the shell and all its subshells. There is nothing left um, like vulnerable or missing or something like this. It would be a complete. With two electrons, uh, uh, the oxygen atom is complete. Okay, these are all examples of ionic bonding, when electrons are actually moving from atom to atom. And um, the last one I would like to basically use as an example a different kind of bonding when you see ionic bonding is more often occurs when one of the elements is metal because metal has freer electrons on the outer shell now let's talk about different thing we will talk about monoxide carbon monoxide this is carbon monoxide formula so it's one atom of carbon, one atom of um, oxygen. Well, we usually um, deal with uh, carbon dioxide, which is CO2. That's what occurs in, um, in, in air, basically. And um, it's involved in some chemical processes, etc. But sometimes, if there is an insufficient amount of oxygen, this molecule is formed which is actually very harmful for breathing. I mean. However, I'm not talking about harm, I'm talking about how this molecule is created because it's simpler than CO2 and on a simple example it will manifest whatever I want to say. Now, the carbon has formula uh, electrons 1s2, 2s2, 2p2 and its atomic number is 6. Oxygen, atomic number is 8, we already covered that. Four. So, now the problem is, this is not a metal. So it does not really leave from the second shell these two electrons to complete oxygen. Doesn't happen so easily. So, how this molecule actually is arranged? Well, this is a different kind of bonding. So, ionic bonding, which we were talking about before, is when electrons are actually moving. In this case, electrons do not move because carbon doesn't really let it go so easily. However, again, under special condition, whatever, the bonding is um, created by doing the following. And I think I better do it with um, with a drawing. So if this is nucleus of carbon, this is nucleus of oxygen. So the first lever, the first shell has two electrons. No problem with that. Second shell has only the first subshell two electrons and this one has two electrons now the second subshell of the second shell which is this one <coughs> it has two and this one has four so what happens 
these six electrons, two from, um, no, this, one, two, and one, two, three, four, these two and these four, they are somehow become a common property of both atoms, atom of carbon and atom of oxygen. How it's arranged geometrically, I cannot say, but in any case, they considered by both atoms as theirs. So carbon considered these six as its, which completes its second shell, and oxygen considers these six as its own, four of its own, really, and two which I kind of borrowed. So they are sharing the responsibility, it's a joint custody, if you wish, um, of these um, six electrons on the outer subshells. And that becomes, and that makes complete both atoms, and that's why they are bonded together. So the sharing, mechanism of sharing these electrons, which are under joint custody, becomes the glue which glues two uh, atoms together. <laughs> I'm using this kind of comparison with uh, divorced parents, but there are still common children which they have joint custody, and they're still kind of meeting. Parents are meeting. Even their divorce, they're still meeting for like bringing up their children to pay for the school and whatever else. So this is another kind of bonding. It's called covalent bonding. So the first one is ionic, when electrons are physically moving from one atom to another, and the second one is covalent, and this is an example of covalent bonding. And uh, I think that's all I wanted to talk about today. So it's all about how the molecules are combined from atoms. There are ionic or electrovalent uh, bonding and there is a covalent bonding. First one we are transferring electrons from one atom to another. The second one is sharing, shared custody. Okay, that's it. I suggest you to read the notes for this uh, lecture on unizor.com. There are a couple of much better pictures than this one. Um, other than that, that's it. Thanks a lot and good luck.